You cannot get a literature degree without being forced to read this story here today. Let's talk about some of the symbolic and religious elements in this story for what is ultimately kind of a very mystical, strange, bold story, right? I think Hawthorne is the wordiest wordsmith. <laughs> Let's get into this. <laughs> he is quickly writing his fastidiously written <laughs> piece here. <laughs> I need a thesaurus and then a thesaurus 2.0. <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I am not so young crypto anymore. If you are new to the Codex Cantina, we like to take a conversational approach to discussing and understanding the literature that we read. If you're down for that, please hit the subscribe button to join us. And as always, we start off with publication information. And Young Goodman Brown was published in 1835. And we'll leave a couple links in the description below where you can listen to it or read it for free. So the author of The Scarlet Letter, Nathaniel Hawthorne, right? Born in Salem, Massachusetts on July 4th, 1804. He was an American dark romantic and short story writer. Right. As we're talking about Hawthorne, it is noteworthy to point out that his father, John Hawthorne, was the only judge from the Salem witch trials that never repented his involvement in the atrocities that took place there. The Puritans believed in a very strict biblical life. If you did something wrong, you were punished very severely. And I think we see a little bit of element of that. And I think we see a little bit element of that their social lives were driven by your church, your fellow churchmen, your fellow your fellow religious colleagues were more important from an identity standpoint. And I think that's what we kind of need to remember is that these were different eras upon which different values were prioritized. And I think that comes out clearly here in kind of the two major themes that take place in this story. And that's the idea of temptation and the sins of man or the evil that is in man or how we look at evil in other people and how as we grow up and we learn more about our fellow peoples, we kind of lose that innocence of believing that each of us are good in a sense, according to Hawthorne. All right, now for the wordiest word wordsmiths of plots. A young man leaves as dark approaches and his wife, Faith, begs him not to go. He pushes on, enters into the deep dark woods. There he meets a robed figure with a serpent staff. And it turns out to be the devil. The devil shows him members of his faith, like the minister deacon and lady who taught him the catechism, and his ancestors who have committed terrible and horrible atrocities against mankind. <laughs> and the, the devil leaves good Ben Brown with his staff as they enter deeper into the woods. They find a seance or hymn circle of sorts where there's a cult-like gathering where they have a new convert. Oh no, it's faith, his wife. <laughs> Here, Goodman Brown sees all the members of his community partaking in the sinful activity. Oh, poor Goodman Brown later wakes up in the village to see his town members acting normally as if they were not just at a seance and he did not just catch them in the woods. <laughs> so Goodman Brown becomes a cantankerous old man with trolls from his religion and society to die alone. The end. Good story. <laughs> Wow, you said that laughing the whole way through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's just a lot of stuff happening here. So this is a heavy allegorical piece, and I think you have to start with the names. Definitely think that there is a versus here, but I think it's our view of ourselves, our view of our expectations of ourselves versus our view and expectation of others and how they should behave according to a specific religion here. So the wife's name is Faith, and she represents kind of how Brown loses faith in his religion, his religion, his, his faith in his religion, if you will. And you have to remember that marriage was kind of one of those things in the Puritan life that your relationship on earth was what it was supposed to be like after you died. That was going to be your relationship with God. So you're supposed to love without regard, without any hesitation your spouse because that's what you were supposed to do from the Puritan eyes to God. Yeah, and they do not believe in divorce whatsoever. That was a Catholic thing, which again, they have broken away and branched from and become much more strict in their rules and regulations when following the Bible. So another noteworthy thing here is Goodman is not his name. That's just a tile, Goodman or Goody. Those were just like the equivalents of Mr. and Missy, uh, Mrs. I'll read a quote here for you. The term Goodman and good wife or Goody was a designation for the middle class. They were polite and respectful forms of address for persons who were entitled to no other in New England. It was respectable, but signaled no elevation in social status. Now, the other two elements that are going to come to play into this with religion, of course, are the robed figure, who kind of represents temptation, sin, maybe. And we have the Salem village, which is, uh, we're going to have to talk about the Salem witch trials, right? Yeah, for sure. And just a real quick history lesson here. Basically, what happens is, is that 
there is an argument over land in this time period. Land is everything to these people. Religion is everything to these people. And there is a nurse that is used as kind of a scapegoat as a witch. And then she is killed as a result. And then kind of mass hysteria breaks out. There's a lot of historical theories of why this takes place. Uh, but basically, in a nutshell, they kill nearly 20 people uh, young women and one man uh, as a result of kind of this mass hysteria of them believing that these people are witches. And it all comes down to overzealousness of their religion and trying to control land uh, in this area of Salem, Massachusetts. Which in one word is all choices, right? And I think that's what Hawthorne is injecting into this story is choices upon his characters. Because I would, I think, to your point earlier of his, you know, his ancestor being the only one that didn't put forth regret for the Salem witch trial murders. Um, I think he feels a lot of shame, a lot of loss of dignity from that. And I think this is him trying to talk to those choices that we make as people. When we have temptation, when we have virtue put forth in front of us, we have a choice of what to do. And I think that's what he's kind of calling out is the hypocrisy of not necessarily the church, but mostly the church goers or the religious people that, hey, even though we're supposed to be strict and punish each other real harshly if we do some sort of sin, he sees all these people in his community. The devil shows him the people in his past, and they call back to his ancestors how they committed, and this is a reference to actual historical events, basically sins or atrocities against humanity, that I think he's kind of calling out that the, hey, we can stand behind and try to pretend to be good people. We can say we're good Puritans and that we'll punish the wicked, but before you punish someone else, you need to kind of look in the mirror yourself. Are you truly being a good person? Because he sees the lady that taught him the catechism, he saw his minister, the deacon, all of them are committing these sins and atrocities, and then the next day when he sees them, whether it actually happened or not, the next day when he sees them, they're all going about doing their religious good life duties, almost not even acknowledging the the issues that they have internally. For sure. I think you hit the nail on the head is that Hawthorne here is trying to repent for what he maybe feels his father did wrong in this situation. And he realizes, you know, we're living this very strict religious lifestyle and that's good and I'm fine with that. But maybe there is something to this idea of forgiveness that the Catholics have where we're seeing us as ourselves do something wrong and then punish one another. But then you have to get past that and forgive one another. And his father wouldn't. His father would not repent his father would not forgive that maybe he made a mistake. And I think the Hawthorne is trying to say, you know, hey, if you don't, if you don't forgive others and you don't realize that you can make mistakes as yourself as an individual by being too hypercritical of others, of them not following the religion as well as you have, you possibly lose everybody in your life that you love. And that's what happens uh, to, to Goodman Brown here is he loses his wife and everybody and becomes a bitter, hateful old man. So crypto, my history teacher, you sound fired up about this. Tell me more about Puritans in Salem. So one thing that you have to know about the Puritans is that there's always this idea that all of your sins have to be public knowledge. Everybody has to know everything that you've done wrong. And Hawthorne writes about this in the Scarlet Letter. And here the Puritans think that the punishment not only must be public, that it must be severe as well. What happens, though, is everybody kind of starts seeing the bad guy in the hidden shadows of everybody else in the villages at this time period. And these are very small communities. And they start just blaming each other for things. And they start, you know, calling each other out with no proof whatsoever. And then people start dying as a result, especially during the Salem Witch trials. And Hawthorne pulls no punches when it comes to making sure that he knows that this is a biblical conversation. The quote when he says, so saying, he threw it down at her feet, where perhaps it assumed life, being one of the rods which its owner had formerly lent to the Egyptian Magi, which is clearly a reference to Exodus 7, 10 through 13. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron threw his staff down in front of the Pharaoh and his officials, and it became a snake. Pharaoh then summoned wise men and sorcerers, and the Egyptian magicians also did the same things by their secret arts. So I think the way that a lot of people have traditionally interpreted this passage and this reference to Exodus is, okay, why did God give Moses and Aaron the snake if the opposing side's just going to do the same miracle, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> 
I think this is meant to kind of explain how Moses and Aaron are going to encounter doubt on their journey, as well as they're going to find evil everywhere. Evil will be in the Pharaoh's arms as well, and it'll be just as powerful as the Lord, but they still must have faith, there's that word again, to continue believing in their religion and continue going down the good path. Now, what does Nathaniel Brown do with our our Goodman Brown in this situation? He is also given a choice, and he's also given a chance to follow faith or to fall off and, and have evil everywhere is kind of, I guess, kind of the theme that Nathaniel was kind of going for in this one. We have this symbol of her dang pink ribbon. Did you notice that? No, I didn't pick up on that. Yeah, they reference her her pink ribbon several times. And the thing with that uh, that I took from that is if you take white as purity and red as sensual or sensuous, which is kind of against the Puritan way of life, in between, when you have good and evil, you have pink. When you have red and white, you have pink. What Goodman Brown is seeing in his fellow countrymen is good and evil. His friends are not Puritans. They're not virtuous. They're pink. They're in between and morally gray because they are committing sins and aren't publicly expressing repentance for their their sins is kind of where I think he was going with this one. Perfect, beautiful use of symbology and color then. I love it. And we should probably touch on woods in literature in general. This is a story where I believe this is kind of brought up a lot by a lot of teachers in terms of symbols too on top of the pink ribbons. You have the woods. Does anything good ever happen in woods in any story that you can think of, Crypto? No, sir. The woods are always a bad setting. You never know what's there. There's always something lurking coming out to get you. Yeah, you never want to go into the woods. You want to stay clear of the woods. And I think he does a good job of kind of incorporating the setting here. And that's something that a teacher may talk about, you know, the use of setting in the story and what it actually means. Well, I think it's good, too, to get students thinking about historical analysis. You have people finding community, finding, you know, community was church and religion to the Puritans, right? So staying there was good, leaving and going to the unknown, which the unknown was a lot more dangerous in 19th century America that uh, that, that kind of furthered and tackled onto the idea of evil can be anywhere and you might you might run into danger if you were to leave your the woods. And that's something that becomes kind of a standard trope in, in modern literature as well is who is out by themselves, not part of a community in the woods a witch, which is kind of funny here that this is something that Nathaniel Hawthorne is, you know, kind of talking about, you know, with his problem with his father in the Salem witch trials, and they weren't even these secluded women out in the woods, but that becomes the standard for what the settings of the woods really means. My faith is gone, cried he, after one stupefied moment. Why did it have to be a stupefied moment? Why couldn't it just be a moment? I swear, Nathaniel Hawthorne. (laughs) (sighs) <sighs> there is no good on earth, and sin is but a name. Come, devil, for to thee is this world given. And I think that kind of wraps up, I think, the battle between good and evil that Nathaniel Hawthorne is talking about that is going on within people's hearts in the story. Yeah, I would agree that's fair. So a lot of people enjoy these conversations, but they're not sure how to pitch in or help out the channel. Feel free to leave a tree emoji or check out some of the playlists <laughs> that will leak down below. Now, Crypto, this is frequently listed as one of the greatest short stories of all time. Does this deserve it in your eyes? Unfortunately, no. Our wordsmith here writes a beautiful story. Uh, sometimes a little hard to follow, but I don't think it's the greatest ever. I think it's a wonderful teaching tool for a few specific items that we've talked about, and I think that it is a nice love letter to him saying, hey, my family's sorry that we made some mistakes and potentially contributed to the killing of uh, you know, nearly 20 people. Uh, But no, I I don't think it's the greatest short story ever. I did enjoy it. And overall, for literary value and personal enjoyment, uh, I would give it a solid six overall. But I can't go much higher than that. For me, I think there's no universal way to document purple prose. But when you have quotes like brandishing his staff with frenzied gestures, now giving vent to an inspiration of horrid blasphemy, You don't need frenzied gestures, really. You don't need horrid blasphemy. There's just an overuse of adjectives and adverbs throughout this whole piece that it's going to slow a reader down when you throw too many. So just something to consider from like a writing perspective. You don't want to be too flowery sometimes because it will slow your readers down. So I'm just going to go with maybe like a five for this one. I didn't particularly care for it, but I can fully understand. It might be your favorite story of all time. You're going to have to probably read it, though, if you're in a literature class, so... (laughs) 
<laughs> hopefully you had some fun with it and learned something from it, if not. Yeah, what your teacher's going to do is say, hey, all those vocab words you don't know, you're going to look up and write them in your own sentence. That's what's going to happen. So be prepared for that. Enjoy that little nugget of fun. <laughs> we all had to do it. <laughs> well, guys, if you enjoy the conversational approach to discussing and understanding literature, we'd appreciate you hitting that subscribe button. We post videos every Monday and Thursday. Join us. Una out. Peace.